We're speaking about the evils of short-termism. Our guest is David Cody. He's the former chairman and CEO of Honeywell. His new book is called Winning Now, Winning Later. I took the job and then the uh, chairman and the board told me that uh, they didn't want me to spend any time on the financials until I became chairman and that the current chairman would focus on that. I would see a finance guy and say something like, so how's the quarter going? And they would literally say, I'm sorry, Dave, but I've been instructed not to answer any of those questions from you. So, oh, well, okay, this is pretty weird, but all right, I'm here and it's only four and a half months, so I'm not going to get hung up on it. Little did I know what was awaiting me. So you showed up and eventually you saw the financials and what did you discover? It wasn't just the financials. I ended up learning that uh, culturally and strategically we were uh, deficient also. So on the financial side, we had a significantly underfunded pension plan. It was 79 or 80 percent funded. We had a pile of environmental issues that a 100-year-old chemical company has. And our strategy, I was told, uh, was to fight it in court until we lost and then pay whatever it was. We had asbestos liabilities that uh, hadn't been addressed or reserved for. Uh, over the previous decade, our, uh, uh, for every dollar of income, we only generated 69 cents of cash, meaning there was a hell of a lot of uh, aggressive, let's say, unhealthy bookkeeping going on. Uh, a lot of focus on just make the quarter regardless of what the next quarter or next year meant. You'd worry about that when you... Uh, when you got there. Culturally, it was three different companies, Allied Signal, Honeywell, and Pitway that had been brought together and not integrated. It was uh, three separate cultures. And when I started to try to understand, well, uh, where are we going? What's our, where's our investments for the future? I found out we were only spending about 3% of sales on R&D. We'd cut a lot of our uh, global focus uh, we didn't have much in the way of any process work going on. So I was really pretty astounded. And then, uh, remember, I was not regarded as uh, the guy who was going to be able to save this company. In fact, on CNBC, one of the commentators had said, we don't think this company can be turned around. And if it can, this is probably not the guy to do it. He didn't make it to the first tier in the GE succession race. And he wasn't even the first choice to run Honeywell, both of which were true. And when right out of the box, uh, I ended up uh, taking my numbers down for what the ensuing six months were going to be. And then three weeks later, had to take it down about an additional 20% because uh, estimates that we pulled together were just so ridiculously aggressive and unmakeable. I looked like they were they were completely right. I mean, I looked like a complete fool. So e even though I had a, let's say, not a very good reputation going into it, I, I made it even worse when I had to do that. So from that road on, uh, to end up generating an 800% overall return, two and a half times the S&P 500, and uh, taking the market cap from 20 billion to 120 billion, we generated 2,500 401k millionaires, uh, that felt pretty good. And uh, in retrospect, kind of interestingly, nobody remembers what they thought of me back 16 years ago when I had started. Um, they were very happy with the success as it was. I'm the only one who seems to remember it. During those early days when you discovered this, what kept you going? How? Why didn't you just throw up your hands and say, you guys misled me, I'm done? I had two choices. One was that to run away. Uh, the second one was to figure my way out of it. And I don't know, I guess I don't think of myself as a runaway <laughs> kind of guy. It's, you, uh, sometimes things are better than you think. Sometimes they're worse. In this case, they were worse. And I felt like it was up to me to figure it out. A lot of the focus of your book is how to balance or manage things that we typically think are mutually exclusive, such as the need to address short-term results while at the same time 
needing to focus on the long term. And so maybe weave that aspect into this story now, please. Well, it's fundamental to how I think about business and how we ran Honeywell. Uh, human nature makes people want to know, what's the one thing you want me to do, boss? But at the end of the day, uh, the point I always used to make is uh, success in business, and I'd argue in life, is always about achieving two seemingly conflicting things at the same time. And if you want some examples, do you want a low inventory or do you want good product delivery? Do you want people closest to the action empowered for quick decisions? Or do you want to have good control so nothing bad happens? Do you want to have low functional costs for HR, finance, et cetera? Or do you want to make sure there's great internal service? Uh, do you want good short-term results or do you want good long-term results? In every case, the trick is figuring out how do you accomplish both? And it's not so much balance as it is figuring out how do you accomplish both of those things at the same time? And I first came across this when I ran an inventory reduction effort, God, it's like uh, 35 years ago now, I guess. And it really struck me that what we were trying to do is, I was the name of it was an inventory reduction task force, but we quickly glommed onto the idea that it would not be successful unless we could improve customer delivery at the same time. And I started referring to it as my any ninny theory, saying any ninny can do just one thing. The trick is to figure out how to do both. And the same is true when it comes to short-term, long-term. And I was just very frustrated by everything I read out there that talked about short-termism as if you either chose to be a short-term focused or a long-term focused. Uh, it, it, they were mutually exclusive, to your point. I always viewed it as mutually reinforcing. You had to do both. How does one do both? Obviously, this is an extremely difficult thing. It's very easy to talk about, but extremely difficult to do. I mean, just look at public companies and the way public companies are run, and I think that establishes the difficulty. So how do we do it? The first thing I usually suggest is uh, the leader has to change their own mindset. And uh, getting back to that inventory reduction task force, uh, because of its huge success, I had to go around the company, GE at the time, talking about it everywhere. And in the audience, somebody would always say like, okay, Dave, well, what's the number one thing you did? And they always want that, okay, what's that one thing? And I would say, well, it's a matter of changing the mindset. If you can change the mindset, you can get there. And people would nod their heads, go, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and then two minutes later, someone would say, so Dave, though, what was the number one thing you did to make this successful? And it's like, nobody wants to accept that it starts with the leader's headset first. You got to get that mindset right that says, okay, this is doable, and this is how I'm going to do it, go about it. Uh, then the leader needs to talk about it. And then most importantly, they need to walk the talk. So if they hear the leader talking about, uh, we, we need to make short-term numbers, but we're going to do it the right way so that we're still achieving the long-term. But they see uh, the leader agreeing to accounting adjustments, so no cash, but money comes in. Uh, distributor loading at the end of the quarter. Uh, cutting some of the long-term funding in order to uh, make it. Uh, they immediately, it's like parents, you know, the do what I say, not as I, not as I do. Uh, they'll do what they see, and that's the way they're going to act. So the, the leader's role here is paramount uh, in how they talk about it, but also how they walk the talk and the discipline they're willing to have. And the biggest thing I think they can do uh, is, and we talk about this, is to grow sales and hold fixed cost constant. Uh, it sounds very simple. And if you do the math, it's very simple. And you see variable margin falls through at a significant amount. But holding fixed cost constant is not easy because uh, most of fixed costs, 60 to 90% of it in most functions is people. And if you're giving people 3% raises a year with comp and benefits, and you're trying to hold it constant, that means it has to go down. Headcount needs to go down 3% every year when everybody wants more. And that's where the process work comes in. And you have to be doing the process work in order to be able to do that so that you don't devastate the company as you uh, try to accomplish it. But those are just some of the initial thoughts. There's a lot more, of course, but that's, uh, I think, a pretty good broad brush to start with. Let's take a question from 
LinkedIn. And Sarbeet Johal is a very interesting fellow who I know. He asks, how important is financial engineering as opposed to core engineering in running a company? It depends on what you mean by financial engineering. Uh, there's a, a disparaging approach to it where you just load up a company with a big amount of debt, and that's uh, obviously not good. But I do think uh, running any company with a reasonable amount of debt makes sense. And because if you can get that debt inexpensively, so you're paying 3% for it, but you're able to invest it at 15%. Your investors are seeing a 12% return on the investment you made. That's a pretty good deal. If by financial engineering, you mean loading up with debt, uh, booking income from accounting, uh, the distributor loading that we were just talking about, no, I think that stuff's hard because that's, that's just not a smart practice at all. You're going to destroy the very thing that you're trying to create, which is a great long-term growth company. And that long term is important because eventually the long term becomes the short term. If you haven't done that seed planting, then it never comes. Where do you focus and can you say that the product development is more or less important than the financial aspects of the company? And I think that's also what he was probably trying to get at. From my perspective, again, what you want to do is accomplish both. And that's uh, uh, the whole point of the story is. Uh, how do you generate good enough short-term results so that your bosses, your investors, whomever, are going to stay supportive of you, but at the same time, do the seed planting that you need to to grow? And as you might imagine, I'm very big on the R&D side. We took uh, R&D from 3% of sales to 6% of sales. At the same time, we doubled the size of the company, so in effect, quadrupled our spending. That was a big increase in product engineering. But I didn't do it overnight because uh, the organization, if there's just too much stuff, too fast, uh, they can't absorb it. And what you end up with is just a bunch of wasted money, a bunch of uh, wasted ideas. So I tried to do it in a way that, um, so we'll say that externally, our peers were uh, look at committing to an 8% earnings increase. Uh, I would commit to a 9% earnings increase. But I would have a plan internally that generated an 11% earnings increase, including funding for all those long-term initiatives. And that's why doing things like holding fixed costs constant and having growth programs that you've initiated that start paying off becomes so important. Why then is it, do so many business leaders find this incredibly challenging and they take a reference point of the short term, even though it's obviously at the expense of, of long-term value? Well, it's easier, <laughs> right? Like uh, I was saying before, human beings want to focus on just one thing or uh, be able to blame somebody else for why they have to focus on just one thing. And that's why uh, the title of the first chapter is Banishing Intellectual Laziness. Because the first thing you have to do is the leader's headset mindset needs to change. Whether you're running a group of five people, 5,000 people, or 50,000 people, that headset change has to start there. And if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And then, um, you know, I wouldn't have to write, write this story. But the fact is, it's uh, not easy to do. But... I think it's going to be fundamental to our uh, success as an economy and for any companies around the world, but especially for U.S. companies to start to be able to do this. We have some more questions from Twitter and LinkedIn. So number one from LinkedIn, how do we handle the growing mistrust in government and corporations? I guess the first thing we all need to do is uh, act in a way that's trustworthy. Uh, some companies don't. And that's always uh, what gets all the attention. But, you know, I'd say at least 90% plus of companies act the right way. And it is possible to be doing the right things at the same time you're doing the right things for the share owner. If you take a look at uh, uh, Honeywell, for an example, yes, I like to talk about the 20 billion going to 120 billion in market cap. But at the same time, we put in $10 billion 
to funding our pension plan because they felt like we had a commitment to retirees and we ended up with an overfunded pension plan. Uh, we reserved for all of our asbestos liabilities and started resolving those. And we spent three and a half billion in 15 years resolving all of our environmental liabilities so that we could have a clean company uh, going forward uh, for my successor. So the first thing is to act that way. And then the second one, I think, is to talk about it. Uh, most companies don't want to, and that included me. Uh, I didn't want to talk about the environmental progress we were making as a company because it would attract all the people who never think you're doing enough. Even though I was spending three and a half billion dollars to fix all this stuff, for some, it's not enough and you're just always going to be evil. And I didn't want to attract those folks. I wanted to just focus on running the company. So I think there's probably going to be more required of companies to say what they are doing and to kind of call some attention to it. How important is transparency in this? Well, I guess it depends on what kind of transparency uh, people are looking for and on what. But I would say uh, at Honeywell, for example, getting back to the nervousness I had about it, uh, my environmental folks wanted to create an environmental focused website to just talk about the progress we were making on uh, improving energy efficiency in our operations, reducing greenhouse gases, uh, water usage, our uh, safety improvements. I was dead set against it and said, look, I, I don't want to attract all the brickbats. Let let's just keep doing our job. Let's just keep getting it done. And uh, you know, we'll be doing the right thing. And that's what matters to me. Well, they kept prevailing on me till I finally said, okay, I'm willing to give it a chance, uh, but this is on you. If this goes south, this is not what <laughs> I'm looking forward to. Well, son of a gun, it worked really well. Because uh, I said, look, nobody's going to believe it because it's coming from a big company. They're just not going to believe it, even, even though it's accurate. We can be audited and all that. But they did. And it ended up working out very well for us. So, yeah, I kind of like the idea of transparency on um, a lot of things. Uh, but you got to be careful how far do you take it. Uh, it's very easy, I think, to get so transparent that you can't make a move or do anything without somebody objecting. So, in general, I like the idea, uh, but it's got to be you got to be thoughtful about your spots. In this example, why did it work? What were the attributes of the situation and of of the actions that you and your team took that engendered that trust? First of all, we did have the results. And if anybody uh, audited them, government or anything else, uh, the results were there and were accurate. I think it also helped that on the environmental side, uh, I'd hired people who had tremendous credibility in the environmental community so that uh, they would never be viewed as uh, corporate shills by the, say, more negative people in the community. Uh, and I think that added to the credibility of it. So, and, and, the, and you could see the results. If you walked through any plant or saw the amount of uh, discharge that we might have reported uh, externally to government agencies, you could see the results. Arsalan Khan says leadership is about setting an example. But what about politics and culture that can destroy that example? How do you manage that? Again, it's this issue of what breaks down trust and how do you overcome that prevailing feeling that often exists out there? The first thing to do is uh, keep acting in a trustworthy way and uh, have a point of view and uh, be open about it. Uh, most CEOs, as I said, uh, everyone I've ever run into, uh, there are some who yeah, do bad things and end up being a bad example for the rest of us. It's true of society in total. I always used to say 90% of people are good and want to go home at night bragging to their spouse and kids about what they accomplished. 10% aren't. That 10% exists everywhere in the world at all levels of society. You got them in your family. They're everywhere. You don't want to judge the 90% based on the 10, but the 10 are what get all the attention generally. So I would argue 90% of uh, CEOs want to do the right things. They're not looking to 
screw anybody or get away with something or do something illegal. I mean, they're just not like that. It's they're human beings like everybody else. So I would say it'd be helpful if people would give them the benefit of the doubt a little bit, but acting in a trustworthy way so that anybody looking at your actions would say, okay, uh, that person, that CEO, that leader, they're real. They, they talk about this, but you can also see that they're actually doing it. That's got to be the biggest thing. It, it, I keep, I use this phrase a lot. I didn't come up with it, but it's walk the talk. And if people can see you walking the talk, uh, even though you're always going to get brick bats because there's 10% of people you can't convince no matter what you do. But about the majority of them, I think, when they see how a leader is acting, will then give them the benefit of the doubt. We had on this show as a guest, Joel Peterson. He's the chairman of JetBlue. And he used the phrase, we were talking about this issue, and he used the phrase, it's important to solve for fairness, meaning in your business dealings that, that, that you're looking for, fa for f fair outcomes for everybody. And I'm wondering, as you were sort of dismantling, figuring out the, all the issues, uncovering the issues at Honeywell, and then reconstructing the business, how did this concept of solve for fairness come into play? I didn't uh, use that phrase, but I use that word a lot. And it's whether it's dealing with uh, partners, customers, suppliers, employees, uh, compensation. Uh, in every case, uh, fairness was the, a word I used a lot. And it's because it's um, important to people. And it's always true. People have, just have this kind of sense of wanting to focus on, okay, what's fair here? And uh, it was an important concept for me. So, uh, yes, I use that phrase, not that phrase, but that word, fairness, a lot. This notion of fighting the short-termism by understanding the, both the, the short-term and the longer-term goals how do you how do you operationalize that? So at Honeywell, how did you convert that kind of euphemistic concept into operational plans that would make a difference? First, you got to talk about it. Second, you got to walk the talk. Uh, as I said, the things that I did, uh, I made it very clear to everybody, and I met with uh, once the extent of say the accounting issues were understood. Uh, I met with the top 100 finance people from around the world. They happened to have a gathering shortly after the uh, earnings debacle we'd had. And when I understood what was going on, uh, I said, I want to talk to the whole group. And I went there and spent an hour with them and said, no more. No more of this. No more make the quarter meetings where of the 11 items, 10 of them involve accounting or one-time items. I'm never going to agree to it again. I'm never attending one of those meetings. I don't want you to have a single meeting uh, like that. Well, uh, uh, same thing with distributor loading. And I've had the discussion with each of the business leaders and said, I'm going to start putting in audit routines to make sure that this does not happen. No price in terms at the uh, end of the quarter. Well, the thing I did do, as you might imagine, uh, I did get calls as a quarter progressed with a business leader saying, hey, boss, uh, I can make the quarter, but the only way I can do it is if you allowed me to load this distributor or you allowed me to proceed with this accounting transaction. And I got to say, there were some times when uh, I thought, oh, man, I can't believe this is uh, my choice. But every time I said, do not do it. I refuse to allow it. I will not accept it. If you do it, uh, this is an offense as far as I'm concerned. Well, interestingly, we never missed a quarter, even though I never agreed to do any of it. And people end up learning, okay, that's not going to happen. He's not going to do that. And he's not going to cut the short-term stuff because uh, in the strategic planning process, he has us lay out exactly what those long-term initiatives are and how the funding profile is going to work. He tracks that. And then uh, six times a year, he has uh, 12 growth days, they'd be two days at a time, where on key items, you actually have to come in and report out on how are you doing on those strategic items. 
And it's what uh, we used to refer to as inch stones instead of milestones, because too often you do a long range plan, you have your strategic plan discussion, everybody boxes it back up and takes it home and goes back to operating just the way they did before. But I would have these meetings as a way of starting to probe, are we doing the things that we need to? And somebody would have a great initiative set up, for example. And I'd say, oh, man, that, that's tremendous. Uh, th that's great. Uh, what are you doing for resources? And they'd say, well, you know, we doubled the number of people. Oh, oh, that's great. Uh, so how many on it now? Four. So you had two and now you have four and that's a big deal. And this thing could be worth billions. Why don't you put on 20 right now? And they'd say, oh, well, you know, with all the headcount uh, restrictions, it's tough to, tough to do 20 people. I'd say, well, how many people in your organization? 20,000. So out of 20,000 people, you can't find room for 20 more to just focus on this. And then they'd realize how silly it was. And they do the right thing and the growth effort would continue. But you run into this in businesses all the time. Like I said, whether it's five, 5,000, uh, 50,000 people, you run into that all the time. The same kind of issues. Uh, and I call them excuses masquerading as reasons. In your book, you described a, a very poignant example of this, this kind of thinking, where somebody at a chemical plant owned by Honeywell uh, died. And maybe tell us about that. Tell us about what happened and what the causes were and then how you addressed it. One of the things I recommend to any leader, whether, uh, again, you've got five, 5,000 or 50,000, is do what you can to create what I call X days in the year. X days meaning nothing is scheduled for those days. You can use those days for whatever you want. Uh, obviously, the lower you are in the organization, the tougher it may be to do because of boss's demands. But nonetheless, do what you can to, to do that. Uh, I would set aside two to three a quarter at the beginning of the year when we'd lay out the calendar. And I'd probably be able to save one to two a month because something always comes up and you got to give them up. Then you use those days to do what you want to do. And one of the things I used to do is uh, set aside uh, three or four of those days to just think about the company, just freestyle think about strategies, geographies, businesses, people, macro trends, everything that was going on out there and what I might want to do. I would also use those days to do surprise visits in places. And we had had a fatality in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And it occurred because uh, it was in a chemical plant. A cylinder had been mislabeled by a supplier uh, and the employee had not followed the protocol they were supposed to. So the fact that it was mislabeled and then the employee didn't do what they were supposed to resulted in the fatality of the employee. As you, as you could probably tell, it really bothered me that somebody died on my watch uh, like that and um, it was preventable. So I'd send in a team to audit and find out what the heck is going on down there. And I was a little uncomfortable that the team was really getting to the facts of things. So I took one of those days, didn't even tell my assistant where I was going. I just said, you know, get me down to New Orleans. And then once I got there, uh, I rented a car and uh, drove up and I went to the reception desk. And it, it was, this was kind of early on. So you could tell uh, the receptionist didn't know who I was and had to call the plant manager who then came down and, and got me. And I went around the plant and just kind of looked around and just talked to people, talked to the union leaders, then met with the whole staff and just said, geez, you know, how, how did this happen? How, how could this have been prevented? And the part that concerned me was that somebody on the staff said, well, Dave, you know, the thing you need to understand is uh, chemical plants are inherently dangerous places. And we were just unlucky that this happened to us. It could have happened anywhere. And I'll let the conversation run and come to find out the whole staff believed that. And I thought, my God, I, I couldn't believe it. And I, I just wrapped up by saying, 
do you guys realize a man died in this facility and that it could have been prevented? And yeah, he didn't follow his training, but why didn't he follow his training? And why was the cylinder mislabeled? And how do we make sure this stuff never happens again? Well, as you might imagine, we changed out most of the people there. We really upped our uh, health, safety, and environmental game. And it became a model plant after that. It's like people did realize the significance of what had happened and that it was preventable. And it's a, as a result of that, we took our uh, health statistics, uh, safety statistics across the company up to the point where we're something like 80% above the average today. It's a, it's a just very, very safe environments. Cedric Wells on LinkedIn says, what kind of support is needed or should one seek to shift the culture of short-termism thinking? It's always easy in any job you're in to blame the people above you. But uh, all that is is an excuse for whoever that leader is to not start working on the things they can control. So I advise uh, everyone that, okay, you're most likely you're not going to change the point of view of the leader two levels above you. What you can do, though, is affect your own behavior and start thinking that way. And look at your own operation and say, gee, you know, what's the stuff that if I did just a little bit of seed planting now would pay off very well three years from now, even if I'm not here? What are those things I can do? Now, by doing that, you don't just create a better operation, but you start training yourself. You start training yourself to think that way so that as you get into bigger and bigger operations, uh, you're already thinking that way. And the higher up you go, of course, the longer you tend to be in the job. And you will start to see the benefits of that. From uh, Elizabeth Shaw, talking about these X days, she said, everybody talks about the fast pace of business and the chaotic situation that exists as a result. How can an executive create the space to think, to think critically, as you were just describing? In any job you are in, it is very easy to become a victim of your own calendar. And... I was an early victim of my calendar. When I look at uh, 2002, for example, when I first got there, I was just kind of running from one thing to another and uh, you never had time to think. And what you'd find is on one day, you might have four meetings booked at uh, 9, 11, uh, 1 and 3. And what happens is you end up with these like half hour or one hour interregnums where there really is no time to think. And then the same thing the next day. And by creating X days and just forcing all those meetings into a single day, say the day before, yes, you end up with a very busy day before that may go to 8 p.m., but that next day is yours. If you don't set up that time, even if it's only four hours, not even a full eight hours, if you don't proactively set up that time, then you will never get to it. And uh, a couple of phrases, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, love him or hate him, he had this great line that said, beware of letting the urgent get in the way of the important. And it's very easy to get consumed by uh, everything that's going on around you. And I got to really get to this. And if you're at a time like this, uh, there's this old saying that I've always liked that says, if you're up to your butt in alligators, it's tough to remember your original goal was to drain the swamp. And that's true. When you've got 120 hours worth of work and 80 hours to do it, well, uh, you stop doing a lot of it. But if you're a leader, you have to find a way to generate the time to put your head above the fray and say, are we going in the right direction? Otherwise, uh, in my view, you're not being a good leader. You need to make sure you find a way of carving out that time. And that's how I used to do it. Sarbeet Chohal says, uh, behavior is driven by policy and procedures. What can policymakers do to reduce short-termism? For example, there's an SEC rule of financial reporting that worked well for financials historically, but doesn't work for the tech industry right now. I'm a big believer, and I uh, use this line a lot, is that we are not going to regulate our way to long-termism. So I don't think uh, 
government ought to be playing a role here. And when I hear them talk about stuff like uh, reporting twice a year instead of four times a year, uh, that's not going to yield anything because it's just going to be a problem. It's You're, you're not going to get a benefit from it. The better thing to do is for investors to be asking for what are those possibilities, what are those opportunities, and drive it. We have a question from... Twitter, Arsalan Khan is wondering about uh, the chief information officer role. He says, CIOs are always looking to get a seat at the table. Did Honeywell involve its CIO in strategic planning activities? Absolutely. <laughs> I, was a, I was a very big believer in IT and uh, systems in general and uh, the digital economy and how it was going to apply to an industrial company like uh, Honeywell. And even if you take a look at our engineering uh, folks, you would find uh, we had 23,000 engineers. And you look at all the products and chemicals and stuff we're in, and you just said, yeah, you know, 90% of them got to be mechanical, electrical, chemical type engineers. The fact is, half were software engineers. That was just an engineering. Then we had the IT folks in addition. And I was a big believer in IT was going to be an enabler for everything, products, uh, services, uh, process uh, improvements as we figure out how to standardize and mechanize processes. So you're not going to find a bigger believer in it than, than me. Advice for business leaders who want to fight this curse of short-termism and you know, they're ground down by the urgency rather than the priorities, as you described earlier. What should they do? First thing is to go back to something we talked about at the beginning, is that if a business leader believes that and that they don't see a way out, then for that leader, there never will be a way out. There won't. The first thing they have to do is start to re-examine their own headset and say, okay, how do I think differently about this? How do I think about where my costs go? Uh, where am I spending my money? What are those long-term things that I would like to invest in? And I can just start putting some seed money in to find out if there's something there. I don't need to get agreement on the total five-year program. All I need to do is put in a few dollars up front to start to get a sense for, is there something here? And start with whatever it is you can control. But if you believe, gee, there's just too much short-term pressure, then it's just never going to happen. All You've right. Gotta, now, 10% of the time, yes, there, it probably will be like that. 90% of the time, you can do something. So a lot of this then is examining your own capabilities and frankly, seeing whether whether you are part of the, the problem fundamentally. Exactly. It's got it, this, whatever level you're at, it begins with that leader. Another question from Twitter. How can executives and CEOs follow your approach when shareholders, especially activists, investors demand an extractive business approach, which is short termism? You know, as I've said about activists, they're kind of like a free press. 70% uh, of what they do is good. 30% is not and just doesn't make any sense. Uh, we, we got an activist in Honeywell stock, even though we had done extremely well. And we actually got along very well with the activists. We didn't do what they recommended. We did something uh, different that we'd already planned on doing. But we ended up with a very good conversation because we said, all right, uh, we want the stock price to go up. We want it to not just go up now, but continue to go up. So how are we going to make sure we're doing the right things? And as long as we had that uh, a convincing argument that said, yes, we're uh, doing better in the short term, but more importantly, this is going to do really well for the long term, and you can believe it. It's not just uh, you know kind of a hope and a prayer. We actually got along uh, very well with the uh, the activists. Now, 30% of them are not, but you, this is where you have to have uh, a belief in your own case, and it's got to be supportable. And oftentimes, you'll see stuff like, uh, well, you know, a, a company ought to spin off a particular business. That actually may make sense. 
the, the company, the CEO and the board may say, nobody's going to tell us what to do. But if at the end of the day, that creates a higher stock price, meaning it's going to create more opportunity for all the employees there, then they ought to do it. So I've always thought with activists, you ought to really think about what they say, because they may have a point of view that makes sense. You shouldn't just have a kind of retrenching kind of view saying, okay, now we're under siege. Uh, Really consider what it is they have to say. But you got to have your own point of view about what will generate results and be able to support it. Because at the end of the day, investors are going to weigh the two arguments and say, gee, you know, uh, this company hasn't performed in 10 years. This activist has an idea. Maybe I ought to listen to it. Conversely, if you say, well, we have performed for 10 years, this is management's view. Maybe we'll support them. You're chairman of a company called Vertiv. You want to give us the quick sales pitch on Vertiv? I love all the things about Vertiv because it has all the same characteristics that I saw at Honeywell when I got there. It was very much in trouble, uh, but they hired uh, the PE firm, Platinum Equity, hired a very good leader. Uh, He hired a good team. They started to invest into IT to get it to where it needed to go. And as I said, when um, I managed to get into it, it was about where Honeywell had been after the first two or three years. And I liked it because uh, when I, things I used to talk about at Honeywell, I had a great position in a good industry. You could differentiate with technology. It had a lot of sales increase upside because the industry was growing and you can gain share because it's so fragmented and a lot of margin rate upside. So I put all that together and said, oh, this is, this is a perfect place to be. And that's why I'm there. Everybody, we've been speaking with Dave Cody. He is the author of the book, Winning Now, Winning Later. It's, it's an outstanding book. It was called, Fortune called it, The War and Peace of Business Books. Former Secretary of the Treasury, Hank Paulson, said it was the best business book he's ever read. So those are pretty good recommendations. <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> Dave Cody, thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. Thank you. Everybody, thank you for watching, especially the folks who contributed questions. Now is the time for you to subscribe to our newsletter. Hit the subscribe button at the top of our website and subscribe to our YouTube page and check out CXOTalk.com. And we will see you back here very soon with great conversations. I hope you have a great day, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.